morning, ladies. It's uh, it's like 11 ish, and I am very, very excited and surprised to see so many faces here early in the morning. Clearly, this room knows how to party and rally because I saw some faces out last night, for sure. <laughs> It's so exciting to be here today. We're in a room filled with so many amazing women. And for me, it's exciting because I'm here with two brands that I love and work closely with, Dell and Create and Cultivate. And for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, hello, my name is Jessica Naziri. I am the founder of TechSesh and a technology entrepreneur. What really drew me to Dell was their initiative to showcase all of the women who are using their technology, their devices, their laptops, all the great innovations that they're taking part of. And earlier this year, Dell introduced their new XPS 13, which was very exciting for me. It's a combination of fashion, tech, and innovation put in together in one device and really helped showcase my personality and all the other women who are using this device. Also in the room today, we have Create and Cultivate, who, yes, let's give it up for Create and Cultivate, who generously added me to their top 100 list. And it was so exciting to be featured with so many amazing women in technology. You guys are killing it, Della's killing it. And I'm so excited to introduce Jacqueline Johnson, founder and CEO of Create and Cultivate. Can we give it up for Jessica? Good morning, ladies. How's it going? Thank God it's sunny out, right? Hey, girl. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dell, for putting on this amazing event. I am so excited to talk about fashion and technology. Um, but first things first, um, let's talk about the Dell XPS. So um, I don't know if you guys have seen our amazing change the game Instagrammable moment. But be sure to snap a picture because we're giving away three Dell XPSs. Be sure to post your picture on Instagram, hashtag Dell XPS, because that laptop is also changing the game. Um, so get in there and do that before you leave. But look, first of all, let's just invite our amazing panelists up. Come on up, ladies. Let's give it up. So we have some of the biggest bosses in the game in terms of fashion and technology here on stage, which I'm so excited about. Um, but let's get a little read on the room. Who here is an entrepreneur? Hands up. Who here is in fashion? Yes, tech. You guys are, everyone's in tech. <laughs> Good job, trick question. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna get right into the panel um, and then we're gonna do a little Q&A later on. So be sure to have your questions ready because uh, you have access to these amazing minds. So, um, so obviously technology is moving so quickly and, and obviously it's forced the fashion industry to change alongside it, like adapt or, or, or be dead honestly in these days. So you really have to kind of get on board. So we're here to chat with some amazing game-changing women on the intersection of fashion and technology, what's happening in their respective industries, and how they're using tech to fuel their businesses. Um, so first things first, let's have you ladies introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about your businesses. Morgan? Hey everybody, I'm Morgan Devon, CEO of Blabity, which is a media company and platform for black millennials. So we have a really cool brand, one of which 2190 focuses on women and fashion and culture. So super excited to be here. Hi, um, I'm Genevieve Padalecki. Um, I run a lifestyle blog called Now and Jen, um, and it's uh, <laughs> basically with me and my kids and my family running around um, fashion, health, fitness. So I'm also excited to be here. Hi, I'm Nicola Honeycutt. I work at Dell in the CMF group, and um, I work on color materials and finishes with a, a graphic design background. Um, and I'm also happy to be with these ladies. Hi, my name is Charcy Evers. I'm a fashion and retail trend analyst. I work with creative directors, product development people, and designers, and advise them on trend direction. And I also am a retail trend analyst on Wall Street and advise institutional investors on publicly traded retailers and the trends that emerge and affect them. And I'm very happy to be here. 
Yeah, so growing up, I wanted to be a trend forecaster. I was like, that is the coolest job ever. I was like, do I get to just walk around Soho in New York and be like, yep, yep, that's cool. Um, but obviously there's so much that goes into that analytics and data. Can you tell us a little bit about basically how you do your job and how you sort of direct brands um, to find those different trends? Sure. Well, obviously, a lot has changed with the internet and the access, sheer access to information that we have right now. Um, things are working much closer. There's a lot to do with speed to market. So when brands are developing things, I know you've heard a lot about this because of fast fashion, because of um, Instagram, there's a need for designers to produce their collections much closer to market because the consumer wants what she wants when she wants it and on her own terms. And if you don't deliver to that end, you lose her. Um, so I basically work across industries, whether you're a, a beauty brand or an accessories brand or consumer goods, and I take what I know about that industry, um, figure out what's happening in that industry going forward, what the trend direction is, and then decipher what works for that particular brand. And that's really the key to trend forecasting is the interpretation of that trend, how it works for your brand, and then timing is key. Because if you can, you can jump on something too quick and your customer is not ready for it, or you can miss the boat. So it's really kind of finding that sweet spot of when, you know, timing wise. Absolutely. I mean, content creation is a 24 seven job and now really every company is a media company, even if you are a media company. I mean, that you really have to be creating that content 24 seven to be keeping up. So that's a great point. Um, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, obviously fashion influences technology, but um, Nicola, how is technology fa uh, influencing fashion, would you say? Um, I think that technology and fashion are now kind of blurring together if they haven't already merged pretty well. Um, I would say one amazing thing for me, so color materials and finishes, I work on all the materials, aluminums, paint colors, resins. Basically technology is driving new innovations in materials, in fabrics, in things we've never done before and things you can do faster and lighter and stronger. Um, and also one amazing thing to me is that new colors could actually be invented with um, advances in technology. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, obviously wearables are getting more sophisticated and um, you know, they, they're obviously a, a fashion statement, but they're also gonna improve your life. They're gonna, they might change your life. And I think that's what technology can bring to fashion. And it's just, like you said, it's changing so quickly. Um, it's pretty amazing. So the, well, we were just having a conversation before we came on the panel and it's really changed Technology has changed my job so much that I feel like I talk more about technology than anything else because what's driving trends today is technology. It's the innovation that happens with technology because with every new innovation, the customer's mind is altered, um, their behavior is altered, so there's a new expectation. So really, if you want to know where the consumer is going to be next, you need to follow those innovations and really be on point with them. So I talk a lot about that in terms of trend development because that's really where it's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. I think the lines are getting really blurred. Um, a friend of mine, Micah, who's actually here, was wearing this amazing bangle the other day. And I was like, oh, that's so beautiful. And she's like, oh, and pulls it apart. She's like, it's my phone charger. And it's one of those things. I, it was amazing. And I was like, shut up. Just plug it right in. But that's the thing. It's seamless. It helps your life. And it really is like becoming, you know, more and more blurred where it's like you're not even knowing the difference between those things. Um, so Morgan, let's talk a little bit about Blavity and, and the empire really that you've sort of grown out of that. Um, you know, content really became queen a few years ago. Um, and how have you sort of expanded and, and kind of you've gotten more niche in the different areas that you guys are expanding to. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so Blavity started with just one brand, Blavity, and what we realized, um, which is again, targeting black millennials in the US. And one of the things that we realized through data actually and through insights and listening to our community is that we were doing the same thing that we blamed other people for, which was treating um, everyone the same and saying, well, you're a black millennial, so you're gonna be interested in this. And in reality, we, um, we realized that we needed to start to create different lifestyle brands that were a reflection of what people enjoyed and in their interests. And so the first thing that we spun off was our women's brand, which is now 2190, because we knew that black women specifically were showing new trends um, towards wanting to be more natural, organic, you know, thinking about veganism, um, having natural hair, getting into technology and innovation. And there was not a place where they could go to learn about that because um, in the black community, a lot of times you learn things from your mothers and your aunts 
response and it's word of mouth, but this is the first time that a lot of us have had the opportunity to even consider being a vegan, right? Like, you know, you go home for Thanksgiving and your mom's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, we're not going to do that. No, like you're eating this turkey, you know? So um, we, similar to kind of what we're talking about today, learned a lot about our audience just by listening um, and then responding and doing a lot of tests to figure out what people were interested in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as the internet is, is growing and changing, niche audiences are really important. And um, I think what people are finding is those, those niche platforms are getting crazy high engagement. Um, so speaking of uh, engagement, Jen, uh, you have a 25% engagement rate, which is through the roof. It's like unheard of. Um, you've crashed sites, sold out products, you know, your audience loves you. Um, but tell us a little bit about, you know, managing that intense growth and that, you know, intensity in the community and obviously not wanting to let them down. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, um, I started blogging last May. Um, and it's, it's, it, I started it as a passion project. Um, I'm a stay at home mom. My husband travels quite a bit for his job. Um, and so for me, I really wanted to do something, um, that was authentic to myself and real and share it. I was shocked by the engagement and um, the community and my audience and stuff and how quickly it grew. And so I think for me, my biggest thing was being myself and um, really just making sure that I was honest and real as possible. Um, and, and I think that has really helped with my engagement. Um, I think in addition, I think as a business and entrepreneur, you have to be smart too and pay attention to what your audience is paying attention to. So I think it's both being you know, real and this is my life and this is, these are the things that I love, but also what are people paying attention to? So I'm really careful about looking at my Google, Google analytics and seeing what people are paying attention to. And, you know, if they're, you know, more interested in that post or, you know, a health and wellness one or kids and my family, then, you know, sometimes we'll, you know, pay a little bit more attention. So I think it's both, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> analytics are crucial to any content strategy. Um, you know, obviously now Instagram has those built in and, and you know, Facebook has those built in, but Google Analytics is a great platform as well. And like, you're able to really get a lot of those deeper insights in terms of, of your, your content. How many of you guys are using analytics um, to drive your content? Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how fast everything's moving a little bit more and how the shifts are really changing to online. Um, two out of three millennials prefer to shop online and 80% of Americans have made an online purchase just in the last month. Um, so we know it, obviously millennials are influenced by tech and obviously that's growing even more so in the mobile space and people just, you know, scanning their thumb and buying something, you know, right away and getting that sort of quick on-demand satisfaction, like you said, Charcy. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how quickly technology is moving and what have you changed maybe in the last year um, when it comes to technology in your business just to make sure you're moving quicker and whether that's a platform you're using um, or how you're using that platform um, or a product. Are you asking me? Oh, everyone. <laughs> no pressure. I'm just staring at you. It's fine. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, for me, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm probably not the best case because I, I literally just started and I feel very lucky to be in this situation and I'm, I'm very excited. So for me, I'm I'm at the place now where I, I'm actually at a crossroads where I'm, I really have to start expanding because I need to start pumping out more content and paying attention now t because this is an actual full-on business. So for me, my biggest thing has been the an analytics and paying attention to how it's growing and how I'm growing as a business. And, um, and, and for me, my biggest platform is Instagram because I feel like that's the most honest um, and, and real because one, you can curate um, your platform, but also I feel like in the stories, it's more of like the day-to-day -day and honesty and the live streaming and stuff like that, which has been a lot of fun. And, you know, you can really connect with your audience and community, um, yeah. I would say for me. but. And obviously video content is huge and, and Instagram stories allows you to do that, but is YouTube on your radar? Is like video content something that's like key to your strategy? Yeah, I just started doing that. And my background, actually, I was an actor. Um, and um, I started blogging because to get back into acting as a mom, you just, you never know where you're going to end up. So for me, I knew where I would be for the most part as a blogger. And um, so uh, being in front of a camera is something that I really enjoy. So I actually, um, I didn't start out YouTubing, but I just started a channel probably, gosh, two months ago. And it's been a lot of fun for me because it's a way just to really, um, I, I, you know, be honest, be in front of a camera, allowing people into your life and being authentic and real, I guess. Um, and I, I think it's a great way to allow people in, um, you know, just get enough 
I don't know if that makes sense. No, totally. <laughs> yeah, YouTube is obviously, and, and the thing about YouTube that's so fascinating is like you have the highly produced content and then you have like the selfie cam in my bedroom content and both do really well. And I think it's important to do both. You know, because I think if you're doing overly produced, like beautiful, it's the same with Instagram or whatever your platform is. If it's overly done and so beautiful, it's one sets an unrealistic example and it's not the truth, you know? So I think it's great to use your phone and, and to, you know, have that one-on-one, -on -one, I guess. And I, I agree with you in terms of things that have changed in the last like three to six months. I actually think our audiences appreciate like done is better than perfect like they want it now right and so you know right now streaming and showing people where that we're here right now if I wait five days to post it like oh yeah I was at South by people are like girl that is old news nobody cares right that's not what was it that's not what it was like like a year ago you know people you could be like we're gonna write a blog post in two weeks about it they want it now, and um, we've definitely had to shift the, our schedules and our business and just how we're operating so that we can keep up with that expectation and then and let go of perfection in a lot of ways, which has been difficult. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Even with us, you know, the, like within 16 hours of our conferences, and it's like, where's the photos? Where's the photo? I'm like, oh, give us the minute. Uh, but no, it's so true. I mean, that content and like that, essentially the new live economy of live streaming, going live and being live in that moment is so crucial. And I think it used to be something where we'd have full live stream teams and, and a whole produced live stream. And now it's literally just your phone. And, and, and you know, Dell is live, Jen's live right now. Hi, guys. Um, but yeah, it's like you have to do it. You know, you have to really be keeping up. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about brick and mortar um, and retail in general and, and try to see the work that you're doing. Um, how are you seeing technology and fashion sort of, you know, translate offline in those like brick and mortar retail environments? Um, when I work with retailers, it's really, I can't emphasize enough integrating and, and combining the online and offline experience for a customer. And I think retail is going through, as we know, a huge transformation. I like to be positive about it. Everyone talks about a retail apocalypse. I think it's a renaissance. Um, and, and it's really about people, retailers, taking the initiative to incorporate technology into their business because it's not going anywhere. And you need to be adaptable. Unpredictability, because of innovation and all of the new technology that's out there, unpredictability is the new normal. So we can no longer react to something. We have to be able to adapt to something. So I always say the best bet for you is to have kind of a startup mentality, right? If you, even if I am an established retailer, yes, it's easier said than done, but be open to new channels of distribution, be open to new relationships, to new ways of working, hire someone from outside of your industry to bring new insight into that. So it's really about being proactive and embracing the technology because it's shifting and it's actually something that is going to help you in the long run. When I, I will say as a consumer, sometimes I don't end up going into a store because I didn't see the, what they had, you know, in the store. And as a busy mom, like, I don't necessarily have time to just go in and browse around, and I wish I did, but it, it, it honestly helps, you know, when a retailer and brick and mortars can keep up with the platforms and, and, you know, put their stuff online so that, as a consumer, you can see what's going on, I guess. Totally. And I, oh, sorry, go okay. ahead. I, I was just gonna say, to that end, sorry, excuse me. To that end, um, what a great um, mall group the Westfield Group, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, down at the Oculus and the World Trade Center, they have now basically, it's all about shortening the distance from the customer to the store, right? So I can be working in, say I'm in Condé Nast and I need a pair of heels for the evening or whatever. They have an app or they're introducing an app where I can order it online and in real time I can get that delivered to my office. They're also implementing a filtering system, also an app, where when I walk into that mall, for that very reason, I'm busy, I don't have time, how, how again, are you gonna shorten that distance? I can say I'm looking for the perfect white blouse. Well, then it can filter down and tell me exactly which stores have them in my size so I can strategically work around that mall. So it, they're a great example of really kind of changing the format of what a mall, because by the way, malls are not dying either, contrary to what people <laughs> say. In fact, I think we need them more now. I love a good mall. <laughs> Hey, I'm a Jersey girl. I'm always going to stick up for a mall. <laughs> I, so go ahead. Oh, 
Oh, no. Oh, I was going to say, sorry. So I'm the non a uh, blogger person that works at this corporation that I love. But I'll say um, one thing that um, Dell does and technology does is you're right. It goes now, we can target in a good way the, our demographic faster and make sure it's accurate and get you guys what you want. And one, it's time. No one has time. So technology is helping you get what you want faster and it's exactly what you want. So that's pretty amazing. We're in this time where it's maybe a little too easy to get what you want <laughs> fashion wise and everything else. And one other side note as far as technology is it might be coming up soon that we, we're in a time where we can download our favorite designer, a handbag, shoes, and 3D print these at home. So technology is changing actually even the way that manufacturing will happen and how you can get it in a minute at your own house. So that's crazy to me. Well, I mean, look at Amazon. I mean, I had the opportunity recently to collaborate with um, Amazon, and now they have this Alexa who, one, you can order your clothing without any actual payment and try them on so that you don't have to make the commitment. Make sure you like it within your own home and return what doesn't work for you. And then in addition, they have this app, you know, where you're literally, you take a picture, have Alexa, you know, take a video of you, and you can see yourself and compare outfits and you know, it's almost like an Instagram platform, you know, or a, a Planoly or a Mosaic or whatever, and you can plan out your week. I mean, it's it's pretty mind-boggling. I'm just going to throw it back to Minority Report. Um, do, we, do you remember when he's like, welcome back to, like, The Gap? Look at Amazon Go. I yes, mean, I it's that. happening. Like, shit, they know I've been here. I know. Right. I know. It's. I mean, that literally that app. Sounds, Don't tell my husband. It sounds like that. It's crazy. I know. It's so true. Like, my husband's already like, you have a 400 boxes here at home. Um, it's my favorite thing. Uh, but, yeah, I totally agree. I think retail is 100% not dead. I think brick and mortar is, is absolutely having a renaissance and I think more so in the experiential side of things. Like I think, you know, number one, people want to touch and feel products and see them, you know, IRL. Um, but also, you know, programming and events and using your retail space as almost like an event space, I think is uh, a great use of that. Um, and it really, you know, kind of, again, provides a double revenue stream in that sense. Um, but really it's, it's, it's an interpretation of your brand offline, um, which I think is really important, and which is why I think Create and Cultivate has seen so much success is, you know, when I started it uh, four or five years ago, it was like everyone was online. You're in the, like, crux of the online community growth, and I was like, I just want to meet people for real, you know, and I think that, you know, now that sentiment's kind of come back and fold, but um, speaking of wanting to touch and feel products, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the Dell XPS and Rose Gold, um, which obviously Rose Gold, a huge trend, um, and something that you guys, oh, you have it. Oh, amazing. So um, it's beautiful. I'm going to keep this one, whoever gave it to me. <laughs> Stick it in your jacket. No one will know. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about how that came to life. Oh, um, well, I'm on the CMF team, so uh, we work. We, Dell does a lot of research to study future buying consumer trends, and specifically to XPS. Obviously, we look to our demographic. We wanted to create something that was really authentic and premium, something that hadn't been done before, um, color and materials-wise. Um, and uh, we did a lot of research and just thought, one, that authentic, authentic, authentic metals were very important, and then also white. Um, we hadn't really seen that done very much and not in um, the way we did on the inside here with like a, yeah, sure. <laughs> with like um, women having women, love it. A glass, glass fiber, glass, white glass track pad, an interior that's just very, I feel like very broad appeal, very sophisticated. Um, and um, I laugh because I'm on the more technical side as well and it has a UV stain resist so it won't stain. Um, but then it's as amazing. far as like, the, the rose gold, it just had a broader appeal. It was just kind of for men and women um, globally um, and just kind of like a really luxurious feel. So we did a lot of research and then we came up with something that, that just hadn't been done before that we feel really proud of and um, that we're really excited about. Just a really, one of the smallest and sleekest notebooks that's, that are out there. So it, it did take a lot of time and um, effort on all, all teams, the ID side, manufacturing, to on, honestly to line up all of these different materials, and that's my job is to make sure the aluminum is a perfect match, and the logo, and the resin, and the paint, and so that, while it's this beautiful product, it took a lot of effort to make sure everything is 
how it needs to be, the quality and, and um, aesthetics, and then also manufacturing. So that was really interesting. Yeah, I was just gonna say kudos to you guys because we, we got one in the, in the mail and you know we get presents all the time as like bloggers, influencers, etc. So I was opening it and you know, I was like, okay, Dell. And then I was like, okay, Dell, like what is I know. this? Oh my <laughs> God. So That's it's beautiful. It's beautiful, it's smooth, like it's dope. So light too, and portable. Well, and as someone who travels so much, I have like this bulky backpack, just like full, and I'm like, I can never find a backpack that can fit, like, uh, you know, my laptop, so it's beautiful, and the stain resistance, like, yes, love that, so good. Um, so Morgan, obviously you have access to so many amazing consumers. What are they interested in right now in terms of fashion technologies, or what are some of the brands that you're seeing them, like, you know, consistently talk about? Um, yeah, so I see a lot of um, people interested in DIY and like being able to customize their products. Um, a lot of women are creating these amazing consumer good tech companies where you can go online and say, this is the problem I'm solving um, with my hair. And then they concoct some sort of hair brands or hair you know, chemistry for your own situation. And I think that that is so empowering for people to not say, okay, I'm going to walk into a store and you tell me how what I should fix, right? And you say, no, this is what I, I wanna solve, and then they can give you the, the right solution just for you. Um, the second thing that is really interesting, not only just DIY with a consumer, but people being able to do it for themselves literally, right? And so a lot of people I think are going back to the basics and being organic and natural and trying to figure out like how do they actually like be more of a minimalist in a lot of ways. Um, I think that's something that I've seen a lot recently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about like some hacks you guys have and some different sites you use to help grow your, you know, different platforms. So I, um, Jen, you mentioned Planoly um, as a great one, and uh, we just had Brandy, um, their CEO, speak at one of our events. Such an amazing platform. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I I love Planoly because um, one, my team is in LA and Austin, so it it enables everyone to sort of work on it together and you can plan out your platform. So for me, you know, we'll upload a ton of pictures and be able to strategically plan out like what we want it to look like and then kind of go from there and have a discussion. It just makes it um, that much easier. I mean, I know for myself, I'm very impulsive sometimes. So, you know, it, it prevents me from just going like, putting a picture up and going, oh shit, I shouldn't have used that one. You know, it's, it's really, it, it's been really helpful to be strategic and, and schedule things. Um, I think that's the biggest one for me that yeah. has been helpful. Any apps you guys use that help you? Um, let me think. I use Asana. I just put our entire team on Asana. They kind of hate me for it, but now I think they I think they love me now. Asana? Asana? Yeah, so um, ASNA. Um, but basically it helps teams collaborate with each other. So projects and communication. We use Slack on a day-to-day -day basis for too, just like yeah. direct DMs and things like that. But when you need like a high level project management tool because you're planning a conference or a product launch, um, Asana has been really fantastic for us just all being on the same page and coordinating amongst teams. And Tarsi, I was gonna say, you know, mobile apps were driving so much um, in terms of commerce. You know, it, is that you know is that trend dying, or do you think more brands should hop on board that trend? Or I think it's still the biggest point of engagement between a customer and a store, and I think it's absolutely essential. It's just the way it's evolving. It's getting more tailored, more curated, and more personal to have an app. I don't know if it's necessarily essential for an emerging brand to invest in that. Um, at first, but it's definitely should be part of their strategy and growth for sure. And I think it's just, it's, you know, the customer expects it now. Again, going back with retail, this online offline integration has to be seamless or else I'm out the door. So if you don't have an app that's working for me or that I can't, that isn't seamless, it's not helping me. Better yet, you better be, when I walk in the door, you better know what's in my mind before I do. You know, like give me a suggestion, something I don't know, surprise me. You know, that's the type of, and the level of personalization that's going to evolve. And I was, you know, going back to Alexa, voice is the next frontier. I mean, I think the Echo Dot has surpassed the sales of the iPhone. And it's really, it is the next, it's not going anywhere. And if you think about voice, it's personalization in, in the most intimate form because it's between one-on-one -on -one engagement. It's not a group. I'm just gonna throw out a little anecdote. Um, one of our head of marketing was out of town for a while and she left her cats at home. And when she got home, the, the Alexa was purring. Like a, with the cats? I don't know if that's
that's like a thing or really? she was like it's so straight but it's like it's like almost adapted to what was probably happening at the house that's, that's they, that's are, awesome. they are going to tailor it to people's yeah. individual voices but that's kind of scary she's like i'm I really know. into cats so it was on brand you i know? will <laughs> also argue too i mean as it is you know it's important to keep up with the tech and the trends and stuff like that but also what has really been helpful too is sometimes you know not necessarily trolling but you know like what i do for inspiration is i'll go to like damsel and dior she does you know she'll explain like what she uses and what apps she's using so for me like that's been really great like doing a panel like this or like sitting in an audience and listening and listening to other people too not just about like going online and you know or you know the the actual technology but FaceTime with people are like listening to what people are using has been really helpful I feel like I totally agree I feel like I learn everything even at work even at Dell and I was I was laughing because I work at Dell, but I don't always hear about what Dell is doing, and I overhear things, and I'm like, wait a second, wait, we're doing this? So, I mean, it's networking. It's totally relationship building and networking and who, I, who you know, and just, I think, just being genuine and just learning, learning, learning. Yeah. And this was the original social platform, you know, if you think about it, this Absolutely. is the best way at the end of the day to connect with people. So we talked a little bit about Alexa, we talked about some of the new um, technologies, but what are some of the devices that you guys can't live without? Well, I laugh because I have a three-year-old, and now he yells, thinking every item is Alexa, and he yells at, at anything and tells it to play Elmo, so that's also good and bad, but yes, we have that. Um, and then I, I think technology in whatever form, whether it's my computer, whether it's my phone, I really, I feel like it should, and it is making my life easier. So in anything you do, if it makes your life easier, and I think um, we try to encourage your life betterment, whether it's your wellness or your mental health or your ease of life. I feel like really anything I'm gonna embrace if it's gonna help my life with children and my work life and trying to balance both as a working mom, so. I've been using um, or trying to use these virtual assistants that are partially artificial intelligence. Um, and it's been so fun to like ask them questions and be like, okay, go find me a salon downtown that can do natural hair. And then they're like, ah, oh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> you know, and then it sends it to a human. If you can't do it, it sends it to a human and then the human finds it and gives you back the answers, right? Um, so some of them are better than others, um, but I've been playing around with that and it's been really fun because like my assistant and my real person assistant is like so happy that I'm not asking her for some of the silliest things that like a computer could just do, you know? Um, but we never had that option for a computer to do it for us um, up until like what? three, six months ago. Totally. And I was going to say virtual assistants are actually so great for women starting a company that don't have like obviously the, the you know, income or money to pay actual assistant. Um, they're pretty affordable and they're pretty good for those, especially just scheduling. It's just like one of those things, you know. Awesome. Well, I was going to say, you know, we have such a diverse background up here in terms of jobs. Um, but what are some of the things that people don't know about your day to day? Like, what is something that people might want to know about the, the actuality of what it's like to be the CEO, to be a content creator, to be a principal designer? Like, tell us a little bit about something unique about your job. Nothing. I'll go first. Uh, well, I'll get no, no, no. no. Um, well, I, I think for me that I'm a mom first, so my day usually starts at like 6 or 6.30 in the morning, and that means like usually getting a kid out of my bed or like going and get the kids and like getting them ready for school. And, um, you know, I think that comes first for me. And then like, you know, then I have a husband I'm going to take care of too is my fourth child. And then, then the business kind of comes in too. So I think I don't think people realize that. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm in the same boat right now. I have a three-year-old and a six-month-old, so I, I am really trying to juggle my job that I love and going into work and, um, and then, of course, being a mom and just having enough time in the day. But um, one thing I did wanna mention is um, for all of y'all, whatever career path you choose or wherever you go, just try new things because my background's graphic design. I fell into product design. I fell then into CMF, which is uh, more of the science of color and measuring color and and it's this wonderful mix of design and aesthetics and trying to like make this beautiful product and then it's also at Dell which is you know very kind of a little bit more structured and the manufacturing and, and it's just an amazing mix and I never would have thought I would have be working at Dell in CMF with I, I think I missed CMF in school I didn't even know what it was and I fell into it and it's this wonderful mix that 
is well suited for my career. So just be open and you never know where networking or, or even just trying new things. Try it. Worst case, go back to what you were doing. It's just an interesting place to be is when you, when you find something you really like, you didn't expect. I second that, couldn't second that more. Um, I think that with trend forecasting, uh, what people don't realize, especially in this day and age of access to so much in information and AI and data science and everything else, is that at the end of the day, it's very much an art and a science. And a lot of what I do is based on a feeling, an intuition, and a hunch. And that's just something that you can't learn. You, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you hone in a skill over time. And I too, I was an English major in college, um, have been in fashion my whole life and then fell into trend forecasting and it became the perfect blend for me as well, the combination of that, so. Yeah, I, fi I think that's so fascinating. Like, you know, what you end up studying in school. I was a magazine, like, journalism major. You know, it really is, like, you know, just using those skills that you learn and then really applying them to what you're passionate about that I really think can make all the difference. Um, but I want to, obviously, you're all such successful women. I want to hear a little bit about um, maybe what the best piece of advice you've ever received was or, you know, what you wish you could tell your, you know, 20-something-year-old self. And if you are 20-something, no offense. <laughs> Um, I think what I wish I would have probably known like five, six years ago when I started Blavity was like, just do it. I spent a lot of time like researching on Quora and Google and reading everything on TechCrunch and everything on Pando Daily and all these other blogs. And if I had just spent those six to nine months, instead of just thinking about it in my head, just starting to like post on Instagram, post on Tumblr, um, I would have felt more free and stopped listening to like the voices in my head, trying to overanalyze everything because you really just can't predict technology and innovation like it just moves so fast so really the, the biggest thing you can do is be consistent with producing and to be and trying things and failing and moving forward so um, I would tell myself and I would tell all of you guys to just go for it like keep it going yeah I, I agree with that I think just you know completely go for it and, and follow your passion and 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 don't be afraid I think like for me I felt for the longest time my feet were in concrete is how I would describe it where I just felt like I'm too, I want to do something so badly and I feel like I really want to be artistic and share what's going on, but I just was too afraid to do it and I just would say my feet are in concrete and I finally went, you know what, I'm going to do it, I'm just going to go for it and, and I'm, I'm really glad I did. And then I think the next piece of advice is that it takes a village, like it's, you know, like you can't do it alone and there's nothing wrong with asking for help. So ask questions, ask your peers, reach out to, if you're, you know, wanting to blog, reach out to another blogger and say, hey, I love your blog, can you give me a piece of advice? Like, do not be afraid to ask those questions and know that, you know, it's okay if you can't do it alone because, I mean, that's nearly impossible, I feel like. Amen. I totally agree. So, what you two said. And then, um, yeah, I would say try new things and um, no fear. Um, and then really just practice, practice and you know you build that confidence by doing at least for me like practice and so I would say um, everyone else is faking it anyway so you might as well just go for it and then <laughs> you, you know it once you practice more often so um, yeah that'd be make my it advice. till you make it I would say um, the best piece of advice I ever got was always take time to mentor whether that's your assistant or whether that's just someone reaching out. Someone just reached out to me that I don't know on LinkedIn and is like, do you have time? Can I pick your brain? And you know, we, we, it's so easy for us to be like, oh my God, <laughs> when will I find the time? But like one of my first assistants is now running Versace. You know, like you don't know where they're gonna end up or whatever, not just saying that, but it's just, it's beautiful to see the evolution of that. And it's, I think that's always like paying it forward as well. And okay. I think also, don't be afraid to reach out to people that aren't in your industry or that don't maybe make sense, but I think everyone's put in your path for a reason and always take the meeting, take the initiative because you don't, if I look back in the way that my career has evolved, I can pinpoint how I knew that person through that person and how I got to where I am because of that. So I'm a big believer in that.
I totally agree. I was going to say, there's no college course on networking, but it is one of the most crucial pieces of growing your career and your business. And, you know, one of the things I always say is to, you know, network horizontally, not vertically per se. Um, you know, similar to what you said is that you never, your peers are on the way up together. And once you get there, um, you're all in it together and everyone's ready to sort of support and help one another. Um, I have one more question and then we're going to go to Q&A, so please get your questions ready. I'm going to come down talk show style and ask them. So um, what are the most exciting trends you see coming up, like for this year or next year or things, you, you know, from a design perspective, from a tech perspective, you know, what are some of the things that you're most excited about? Um, I have two that I'm really excited about. I think 3D printing is really interesting, um, and I think it has the potential to really disrupt apparel. I mean, we think of 3D printing now, obviously it lends itself well to accessories, um, to shoes, Nike, Under Armour, Adidas, they're all doing 3D insoles and everything else. But now the fabrications and the materials are moving much more towards um, apparel and actual fabrics, so the potential to have that, again, speed to market, you cut down a manufacturing time, gets right into the market, is a huge potential disruptor for the industry. And I think um, AI also, if you think of Stitch Fix, um, what they're doing with AI, they're combining a human stylist with an algorithm, with the data that they have from their customers, and it's all creating um, this perfect kind of puzzle piece put together, you know, puzzle put together to help their customer. But on the flip side of that, I'm also kind of, I'm, I'm a fashion purist. So um, I think that AI poses the threat of like, where does the designer, Jason Wu's also done a line for them. Um, where does the creativity of the designer end and where does technology take over? And are we losing sight of that? Because fashion, like trends, like art, like dance, like anything else is to, to make us think and to move us forward, right? And so if it's so predictable, do we lose that element of it? I think one thing from my perspective as working at Dell is that I think hopefully technology will allow less time spent on data entry or manufacturing or figuring out processes and more to support the creative. Yes, like the aesthetic and the, the design side and the stuff that really needs thought and feeling. And um, I think that's one thing that technology can bring that as long as you use it in the right way, it can really free up 100%, that time. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say something else and I forgot. Oh, okay, color. I think color, um, I've been at Dell 10 years, and so we laugh and say, oh, well, you know, what colors are we working on this year? Black and silver, black, a little bit more black. But with, you know, the launch of stuff that's just definitely more sleek and sophisticated and feminine and beautiful, I'm, like, so excited. I love my job, and we have different brands, but color. People are not afraid of color anymore, and even, like, bling bling in color so for me that's really exciting and I get to work on non-black <laughs> well I was gonna say what I find so amazing about this color color we had a big conversation about the color is emotion color is something visceral you can't really explain it but it really touches us and the thing I love about this is how many of you look at your computer like after being on the panel whatever you're like it represents a mound of emails I have to answer or the business proposal I have to finish or the term paper I, I have to write right so having it in rose gold which is universally a warm soothing welcoming color is genius because it, it softens the blow so to speak and then you open it up see you can tell I've study color all the time you open up to this white surprise right and white if you think about what that represents strength the women's suffrage moment but it's also a blank slate right white is clear it's oh, you're, you're open to any kind of creative process anything you can write so I think job well done genius Thanks. and I don't work for Dell <laughs> well from for me from like a fashion perspective like I I really loved the velvet and the corduroy for me. That was a big thing in the fall, and I'm really looking forward to like the menswear, women wearing menswear and stuff. Um, I love following fashion. I'm obsessed with Ripple, which is another <laughs> another technology, I guess. And um, I also, for me, I, I, I love um, repurposed goods, and I really love seeing more and more repurposed goods out there, um, clothing that um, I think in the Oscars a, lot, a couple of people were writing about how their dresses are repurposed dresses and, and Tiffany stuff. Haddish. I She's wearing the that. same dress to every event. I love it. <laughs> I love that, though. Or, like, um, gosh, who was it? It might have been Camilla, maybe, who had, I think her dress was, like, a former dress, and the, the 
the cloth was reused. I mean, I think that that's so great to be able to reuse. Absolutely. Rita Moreno wore the dress she wore yes, in like the yes, yes. It's insane. Incredible. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about is just how multinational we're becoming, like as the internet and more and more people get access to the internet, literally in other parts of the world, um, we're just seeing so much more creativity um, come our way as opposed to it just being America pushing us on everybody else. I think we're seeing a lot more influences um, come into our way of being and I think that's beautiful. Yeah, so just to recap, you know, I think the things that we're sort of pulling out of this is speed to market, obviously being super important on the technology side, but also on the fashion side and the content side, um, personalization, customization, knowing about your consumer before they even know what you're, what you're thinking and really being able to do that, um, voice as a trend and AI as a trend and really um, that, you know, automation as a trend. Um, okay, so I'm going to come down, ask some questions, or you guys are going to ask some questions. So hands up for questions. Ooh, it's okay. It's my phone. It's fine. Um, all right, I'm coming to you. Hi, my name is Danielle Lyles Barton, and my question is for Morgan. Um, so I create sacred sisterhood experiences and programming for women, and I'm wanting to know how you balance creating these real life experiences and then the digital content creation and not being um, overly consumed with focusing everything on digital but still balancing having these real life experiences. Where's the intersection for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, at Blavity, we have a variety of conferences and events throughout the country. Um, you know, I try to focus on like really big flagship moments that everyone can come together. So our women's conference is around 2,000 people. Afrotech, our tech conference is around 2,000 people. But then we do these little micro things around the country where it's like, okay, we'll do 50 people and 100 people and we'll make it really, really accessible. Um, and then we'll try to capture the content from those events and make it online. So you can watch the videos for the, everything online and it builds that community so that when you are headed to some place in real life, you know what to anticipate, you know what to wear, right? We're all looking really fresh today because we know we're at Crate and Cultivate. Like, you know you have to come looking cute. So I think building the community online is incredibly important um, to one, just like getting the vibe and seeding what you want people to feel like when they do wind up in person with you. Um, and that has allowed, I think, us to create really magical moments really quickly and people don't, aren't as like, oh, I don't know, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to think? They're just flowing into it because they already know what to anticipate. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, okay, my question is, is it Tracy? Charcy. Charcy. Charcy, okay. Um, is the difference when you were talking about an app and retailers and brands needing an app and that being critical? My question is, what if you have an incredibly mobile responsive site and kind of the difference, and maybe you could speak to the difference with companies who force you into an app? Because I think even as a customer, I'm a busy mom, I look at stuff, like it to know it, go to a thing. If I'm forced to go get the app, I'm less likely to buy. So maybe, you, but like there's some apps I'm that are amazing that I do know are really great and I only use the app. So maybe talk about the difference in an app and the necessity of that versus mobile responsive or kind of the duo there. Well, I think it's, again, are you starting organically as an app for that purpose, which is then it is seamless or are you putting, implementing an app to supplement your online and offline experience. And I agree, that's what I'm talking about when I say it has to be seamless. If you're redirecting me and I don't wanna go there, I don't wanna download the app now, you can't have that layer because you lose me after that, for sure. Did that answer your question? Also, I just want, can you hold up your bracelet? This is the bracelet, guys, that I was telling you about. Just hold it, how cute, it's a phone charger. Awesome. Yes, you just, look, look at that. Anyway, just wanted to share that fun oh, wow. fact. Awesome. I saw another hand. What is it? Like, what's the yeah, brand? What's the brand? It's Mark and Graham. It's Mark wow. and Graham. Oh. Mark and Graham. I saw another hand up a second ago. Anyone? Did I miss anyone? Okay, well, thank you guys so much. Can we give there's a round of applause? questions in the back. Oh, just kidding. There's questions in the back. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm like blind right now. Okay, here we go. <laughs> My name is Lauren Morales, and I'm from Austin. I have a question for all of the ladies. What do y'all say if um, someone doesn't have the technology to use 
but their cell phones. How would you have them go out there and market their sales out there in the world? Um, how would you how would you tell them to go out there and just keep fighting for what they can um, without the technology or the income? For me, I would just say um, it's old school. It's relationships. It's talking to people. It's talking talking to your friends, telling them what you're looking for. I mean, what your mission is going to be. If you're looking for a job, if you want to start a new company, talk to people. Because there have been many times where I've said something kind of just under my breath, and they're like, "Wait." I, Lo and behold, they're the people that like get me launched into a new career or a new job or something. It's all about for me like relationships and networking, and I talk more than less. So it's like you know people will learn more about me. But just I guess be um, very specific in what you're looking for and put it out there. And people want to help you. I'd say most good people want to help other people and other women. And like you said, we're I mean, gonna go. Not, out you don't want to be in their tribe exactly. anyway. I also think, um, I mean, it depends on what your business is, but I think that, you know, just having your phone, honestly, I mean, with hashtags, I think that's a great way to get people to come see you. I think also networking, you know, as well and meeting new people. But I mean, there's so many apps now that make it so easy to, to use with photography or posting and that it, re I mean, you really can start, you know, do it. Yeah. So don't. Just keep going for it. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would add, I do about 70% of my work on the phone. Like, yeah. when I'm at my desktop or my laptop, it's like a serious thing. It's like Excel, you know? <laughs> um, but most of the time, I'm on the go. So your phone, if, if I could only pick one tool to have, it would be my phone. Do Practice. You, do you all think that um, the phone technology is taking over more than any other technology um, today? As far as on the go or just using it in general? I think it's a personal preference. I mean, I prefer my phone just because it's easier and I would like to do everything on my phone just to have it in one place. But I think it's just personal for people and what they feel comfortable with and what it allows them to do. I mean, it's so portable. Half the time my phone is in my butt pocket. <laughs> so I think, you know, I mean, I think, and it can carry so much. I mean, with all the different technology and apps and stuff that you can have on your phone. I mean, cool. I think <laughs> Thank y'all, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Shiva Tavakoli, and um, I have a hair care company. And I know that AI, augmented reality, is um, becoming very popular with like big beauty companies. But I was wondering how a like more of an indie company like mine could apply that same technology. Well, I think artificial intelligence for beauty. Like first, it's about your online experience, right? So I mean, you, you can look at beauty brands like Glossier, Milk. A lot of them started being, you know, Instagram direct to consumer, um, and you can use AI to speed up your process, right? So when you think about support, when people are asking questions or returns and all that stuff, and you don't have a big team that's outsourced that's answering your support questions, you can use technology to make that stuff faster and leaner for you. So that that's probably the first first step. Yeah, definitely a way to make make that work for you and getting more efficient information on your user and your demographic. Um, yeah, like probably Morgan specific said. needs, right? Different yeah, types, tailored. like really drill down onto the different types of hair because not everyone is created equal with hair. And her company is June Hair Care. Check it out, just a little plug. Hi there, my name is Daphne and I work as a community outreach coordinator for Dress for Success Austin. And um, recently I got the responsibility of kind of growing our social media presence here in Austin. Although we are an international you know, brand and organization, do you have any tips on how to sort of gain engagement and audience and followers on Instagram as a lo locally? Um, <laughs> I'm, I live in Austin, so, um, yeah, I mean, I would say I would reach out to, like, local celebrities or local fashion, um, people, and I would get them maybe to try on different looks and, like, different ways to wear the dress to, because if you want people to be, cons to be buying that dress or w whatever outfit, I would, like, fashion it in different ways or, like, style it around town and be creative in that way. Um, uh, put it in, you know, a different scene, like, maybe at dinner at Juliet in, like, this you know, great outfit or something like that. Um, that would, I mean, that would be my take on it, but. I've volunteered for Dress for Success is a fabulous organization. Yeah. I think if you take it, you know, have a girl's swap of clothing. I love that. And yeah. make it like a cocktail party because yeah. 
Lord knows, or even, I mean, well, not dress for success, doesn't need children's clothes, I'm thinking personally. Um, but to get anything to offload all of my clothes that I don't wear, um, an opportunity to do that, then socialize and then network and have a cocktail, I'm in. So, right. and it's getting your word out, your brand out. So I have a resource to go to when I do have other stuff, I can just drop it off. Also, there's so many great resale stores and, and vintage stores here. I would think that that's just a natural kind of collaboration that you could do something with them because once they're involved, if something doesn't really fit for their business model in their shop, then they can automatically donate it to you. I was gonna also say, you know, bloggers get so much free stuff, and I think sometimes they're looking for a great organization to donate to, so reach out to them, say, hey, I'll come to your house, I'll pick it up, and then you can do a story on them, and then they will promote and post. I just think that's always a great way to do it as I'd well. I'd be happy, I don't know if you're interested. Boom, <laughs> done and done, deal done. Thank you so much, ladies. Let's give a round of applause for this amazing panel. And thank you so much, enjoy breakfast, and don't forget to take your picture, because you can win uh, one of these amazing um, XPSs. So so thank you so much, Del.